This morning we are turning in our Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, beginning around verse 22, we have the testimony of John the Baptist as he exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are those who, some feel that uh, this portion, this last portion we're going to look at is from John the Apostle, uh, but the rest uh, believe it's really from John the Baptist, and I believe that because as I read it and study it and uh, study the different commentators, I really believe this is still his testimony all the way through here. Now, John the Baptist isn't going to be uh, recording of speaking uh, after this, uh, he is going to eventually be uh, taken by uh, Herod and, and, and put in jail, and then he's going to lose his head. Herod's going to kill him. Uh, though Herod himself probably didn't want to do that, he just put himself in a stupid position and he had to do that. Herod wasn't a believer, uh, but uh, Herod had great respect for John the Baptist. And uh, so, uh, here we have this testimony of his, and it's very important that we hear, because remember, John the Baptist is the forerunner of Christ. That is, the Old Testament, Isaiah said that he was going to come before him, and he was going to declare him, and he was going to prepare the Jewish people, the Israelites, for the coming of their Messiah. And always remember that the Hebrew is Messiah in the Latin, but in the Greek in the New Testament, it is Christ. So whenever we say Jesus Christ, we're actually saying Jesus the Messiah. And uh, so he is given his testimony. Remember that he has uh, been filled with the Spirit, uh, and uh, he has uh, the anointing of God, and he is God's messenger. Uh, but uh, he, as he says, I must decrease, but Jesus must increase. And that needs to be our desire as well. Now, John the Baptist here gives five reasons to accept the superiority of Christ. Uh, I thank uh, Pastor John MacArthur, by the way, for just the suggestion of this outline. It's very helpful. So I'm borrowing it. It's not all his, but, uh, you know, we, we borrow as much as we can and, and uh, try to give uh, credit where credit is due. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that uh, we come to this portion of the Word of God. Thank you for the testimony of John the Baptist, uh, the testimony that he gives about uh, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we open the Word, as we uh, study and consider what he is saying here, that we're not just going to learn some facts. We need to see Jesus and see him in the glory that you would have. See him for who he is. And most of all, Lord, to see him as our Savior. I, I, I thank you, Heavenly Father, all the time for thy Holy Spirit and thy precious word. Because without it, Lord, without the Spirit, without the word, how would we know about Jesus? He would just be maybe possibly a figure mentioned here or there uh, in some book history and that would be it. But your precious word tells us about your son who came into this world to be our savior. Bless, O oh Lord. Teach us, O oh Lord. Direct me, O oh Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First, John says here that Jesus Christ came from heaven. Look at verse 31. He says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Now, Jesus Christ was not simply called from heaven or empowered by heaven. He himself came from 
heaven. Because Jesus Christ came from heaven, he is superior to everyone else. Now, you have to understand, here John the Baptist is. He's come. Uh, he has uh, been preaching. People have been coming out to him wherever he is to be uh, baptized, to repent of their sins, to prepare their hearts. And he is the focus. Everybody is focusing on John the Baptist. And John the Baptist must, in his ministry, point to Jesus Christ. He doesn't want the focus to be on himself. It should never be on us. It should always be on the Lord. E even those of us who are ministering and, and bringing the message of Christ, it should never be on us. It must be on him. And that is a great danger that we have always seen over the centuries, that the focus keeps on getting on the messenger instead of on the one who is the message. And so, uh, Jesus Christ isn't merely a man. He is man, but he is God. He is God who has come and taken on human flesh. He has become man at the same time. And as God, he is above all his ministers, his servants, as the creator is above his creatures. On the other hand, John the Baptist says here, he's not from above. He is uh, from the earth. Uh, he's earthly. Uh, he speaks of the earth. In other words, he's saying, I, I have limitations. I can only talk to you about what I've heard, what God has taught me, but I'm still of the earth. I'm still here of the earth. I'm not from above. And so he's comparing his inferiority if, to Christ, looking at the Savior and saying, but I'm not him, and I'm not him, and you need to get your eyes off of me. Now, John the Baptist's preaching was bold, it was powerful, it was persuasive. But he was just a man sent from God. If you turn back just for a moment to John chapter 1, notice John the Apostle writes in verse 6, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Notice he's sent from God, but he doesn't come from heaven. Uh, he's not from above. Only Jesus Christ can make the claim and prove to be true. He is the only one who has come down. And since Jesus Christ has come from heaven, he then represents the Father. I'm going to turn to it, but if you want to, you can turn to uh, Hebrews and chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, the writer, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. He says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. In other words, he's saying here, and he's writing to the Jewish people. Remember, this is Hebrews. That book is basically written to Jewish people. He's saying, in the past, before the time of Christ, God spoke through his prophets. That's how he communicated. And that's why, by the way, don't neglect the reading of the Old Testament. That is God's word as much as the New Testament. And so he's saying in the time past, that's how God communicated. But notice the next verse. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Now God himself is declaring that he's his son, he's the creator, Jesus Christ is the creator, and he said now he is the one who speaks to you. He is the one that we are to listen to. And uh, Jesus Christ, in contrast to John the Baptist, is God incarnate. Remember in John chapter 1 it says, In the beginning was the word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it says, And uh, He dwelt among us, uh, the Word dwelt among us, and uh, we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus' testimony to the truth was infinitely greater than John's. <coughs> Excuse me. Why? Simple. 
He came to the Father. He is the Father. He is the Word. And so he comes, and his message is even greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist's message was, was narrow. It was limited. He was given the message that he was to preach, to teach, to reach people, but it was very limited. Remember, what is he preaching? What is he telling people? That the Messiah is coming. Prepare your hearts for the coming of the Messiah. And then at the end of his ministry, he begins to say, and the Messiah now has come, and his name is Jesus. He is the Messiah. And so that's the focus there. To reject Christ's witness is actually to reject the Heavenly Father. In chapter 5 of John's Gospel and verse 23, we read this. Jesus says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. We know that his witness is true because he is God. And Jesus Christ is the truth. Remember Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the truth. Everything he said was always the truth. And we can rely upon his witness and rely upon it. Now, one other thing. Look here at verse 31 again in chapter 3. Notice the last part of the verse. He says, he who comes from heaven is above all. Because Christ came from heaven, he's above all. That is, he is superior to all, to everyone. Period. Now, one of the things that the Jewish people struggled with was the fact that they looked back at Abraham. And, and, you, and Jesus mentioned the fact that they would talk to and say, but I'm a child of Abraham. And that's wonderful, and that was great, and God had chosen the Jewish people, but they couldn't get their focus on that, off of that. Number two... Their second focus was on Moses. And they said, well, we, we know Moses. Well, they didn't know Moses. They just knew about Moses. But we know Moses, but who is this man? And, and so they wouldn't listen to his witness because their focus was on what? A man. Their focus was on a messenger sent by God. All right? But they were just the messengers. And we're not the focus on the messengers. Dearly beloved, I say it again, it's on my heart and mind. Don't focus on the messenger. Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. If we fail to focus on him, we've got our focus on the wrong place. And so first of all, Jesus Christ came from heaven and he's superior to all. Second of all, Jesus Christ knew the truth firsthand. Look at verse 32. And what he has seen, what he saw and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Now, what has Jesus seen? Well, he's seen everything. Why? Because he is God, because he is the author of everything. And so he describes him as what he has seen. He has seen all of it. Jesus Christ's teaching <clears throat> is superior to anyone else's because his knowledge is not second hand. Mine is second hand. Third hand, maybe. It's not first hand because I wasn't in heaven. Now, praise the Lord, we have God's word. And God's word is inspired. It's without error. It's what we call inerrant. And it's infallible. I'm not infallible. No preacher is infallible. No Christian is infallible. No one in this world is infallible. But Jesus Christ is. 
He is the source of all divine revelation. Look back here in chapter 3 at verse 11. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Jesus Christ was saying, listen, Nicodemus, he was talking to Nicodemus then, he's saying, listen, I speak what I know. I'm from heaven, I know what I'm talking about, but you don't receive our witness. You don't want to hear it. We must not make that mistake. We must realize that this is Jesus Christ. This is his word. By the way, this is his word. He is the word. He has given us the word. He has inspired the word. All of it from cover to cover. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The Scottish people use the word kiver to kiver. Front to back. It is all his word. And then notice what he taught his disciples in John chapter 8. John 8 and verse 26. <clears throat> Jesus said, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. And to his disciples he made a declaration in verse uh, 15 of chapter 15 where he said, No longer do I call you servants, for, my, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Put it very simply, because Jesus Christ alone knows God in the sense that he is God and he has always been with God, he alone can give us the facts about God. And these facts are the gospel, the good news. Again, in chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, that's talking about Jesus Christ, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now, every once in a while, somebody will say to me, I saw God, or I saw Jesus. Now, I wasn't there, but that's not the testimony of the Word of God. You may have saw something, you may have imagined something, and don't be upset. Our minds are incredible. Our minds can do all kinds of things. Don't be upset that you actually didn't. You don't know what he looks like. Anybody here know what Jesus looks like? So, well, I saw a picture of him. Yeah, I've seen hundreds of pictures of him, maybe thousands. It's interesting. So much of the pictures we've seen of Jesus come from the Renaissance. He's got long blonde hair. I assume blue eyes. Do you know why? Because that was their thought of what he looked like, what was around them. But Jesus was Jewish. He would have had black hair, brown eyes. Not long hair because the Bible says the shame of the man to have long hair. And his hair would have been more crinkly. And then he's gone to heaven. You want to see a vision of Christ, look at Revelation chapter 1 and it'll tell you what he looks like. And you wouldn't come walking out and say, oh, I saw Jesus. You'd be going like... Jesus is the only one that can reveal 
completely about God. You know, Jesus isn't a messenger. He is the messenger. I have the privilege, the joy. In fact, all of us do, really. I, don't, I want to be careful about this. We all have the privilege of being messengers of Christ. All right? Every one of us have that privilege. You say, well, I don't stand in a pulpit. Well, that's not the only place you can be a messenger. Every one of us will come in contact with anybody. We are messengers of Christ, but we are not the messenger. That's a total difference. Now, tragically, despite Christ's powerful, authoritative proclamation of the truth, there were those who did not receive his testimony. Look here at the second part of the verse. He said, no one receives his testimony. Now, when Jesus says no one, he's kind of using hyperbole. He's kind of, uh, he's speaking in general. He says, the world rejects Jesus and his teaching. Go back again to chapter 1. John chapter 1. In the beginning of what John was writing about, he says in verse 9, he says, that was the true life, talking about Christ, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And the idea of know him is that they not, didn't know that he didn't, there was somebody there, but they didn't know him intimately, personally. They didn't want to know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, Jesus Christ has came to all of us in the world, and the vast majority do not receive him. In fact, Paul tells us this as well. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, but the natural man, that is the unsaved person, the person who doesn't know Christ, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. When you and I are witnesses to people, when we're talking to people, understand that if they do not know the Lord, what you're saying most of the time is foolishness to them. Now, that's why it takes the Holy Spirit to speak to their heart and draw them to the Lord. Because otherwise they're going like, I don't want to hear that. What are you, a nutcase? What are you, foolish? I'm educated. I have degrees. Reminds me, I went to see my dermatologist the other day. I don't know how many he's got framed, but in the office I was in, there was six of them, which I'm thankful for, by the way. I mean, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And a lot of times when we have so much of the world's education that we reject God's truth. Now, that doesn't mean intelligent people don't get saved, because they do, praise the Lord. And it doesn't mean that you, you can't have any education, then you get saved. No, not at all. God wants us to be educated. It may not be a secular, however it is. But we need to understand that the world doesn't look at God's truth as the truth. They reject it. And the reason people do not accept Christ's testimony and refuse to believe in him is because they are dead, the Bible says, in trespasses and sin. Spiritually, in our hearts, when we're unsaved, we are dead spiritually. Praise the Lord when we get saved. Our hearts, the sin has been removed. We have a new heart in Christ. We've had, we got, we're a new creation, and now we can see with the light. Because before... We were in darkness. And, by the way, the Bible says that we, before we're saved, we're blind. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, Whose minds the God of this age, or this world, has blinded, who do not believe, 
lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan has come along and he blinds our eyes when we're unsaved because he does not want us to see Christ. By the way, the danger also, once we're saved, we can also be blinded. We may be blinded to our sin, our failure to do things as we should, as God would have us to, our attitudes. Sometimes we may even be blinded to God's truth. That's why when we read the Word of God, look to the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Don't just read like you're reading a novel or a history book. Read it trusting the Holy Spirit to guide you and to teach you. And third of all, <clears throat> Christ's testimony always agreed with the Father. Verse 33. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Now, having stated a general rule, John the Baptist gave an exception. Because if you remember the, the verse before, he said, no one believed, right? But that is a general statement. But there is an exception, that is those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Those who the Holy Spirit has spoken to and drawn to the Lord, they do believe him. They are the ones who believe in him for eternal life. Those who receive Christ's testimony thereby certify that their belief in God is true because they believe that he speaks through his Son. In John chapter 17 and verse 17, as Jesus is praying to the Father, he says this. He says, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. Have you ever had somebody say to you, well, this is the truth, right? And sometimes they're right. As far as we know, it, it's the truth. But you know, the problem with the world's truth is that we don't know everything, right? We are not everywhere at every moment. So what we think is the truth may not be the truth. Somebody may tell us about a person and say, well, this person is such and such. We say, oh, well, that must be the truth. But it may not be. Can I know every person? Can I know the inner part of a person? Can I know their soul, their spirit, their mind? I can't know that. I have enough trouble with my own. <clears throat> Somebody might tell you, oh, by the way, just as, as an example, evolution. When I was growing up, there was a theory of evolution, and they taught it in schools. And, uh, you know, being a good California boy, uh, I didn't learn very much. But anyway, <clears throat> it's not California boys, it's my fault. But the theory of evolution that I was taught is different than the theory of evolution is taught today. But I was taught that it was the truth. Now, eventually, thank the Lord, I came to the place and I thought, well, wait a minute, how do they know? Were they there? No. They, they, they change all kinds of things in the theory of evolution. Remember the word, remember that word? Theory. Theory. So people talk about, well, this is the truth. But when we go to God's word, it's not the truth. We find what the truth is, but 
The thing is that people can say something is the truth and it's not the truth. But praise the Lord, God is the truth. All truth resides with Him. Because He is God. He's infinite. He has always been. He always will be. He was before time. He was before He created all the worlds and all the stars and everything that we're seeing. If you go back in just your history, Copernicus, uh, he, he finally came up with a, a, a telescope and he looked up in the stars and he, he could number them. Did you know that? Yeah, he did. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've tried that a few times. I get dizzy when I'm standing there trying to do that. <clears throat> Was he right in the number? Absolutely not. And we've looked at the stars for a long time. And the number keeps on getting bigger and bigger because our telescopes get better and better. You know, Pilate asks, what's the truth? What is truth? And yet he had standing right before him the truth, Jesus Christ. Now even those, those who have called to teach and to preach the word of God, we do the very best to teach God's truth, but remember we are not fallible, we're infallible. We can make mistakes in interpretation. We can be like me and say things wrong as I'm preaching because the brain isn't working, the mouth is running too fast, I've got the wrong note here, I've read it the wrong place, uh, I, <clears throat> I, I read somewhere something and I thought, oh, that sounds good. How many of you here? And I don't know, I assume using a mother, but how many of you here were told cleanliness is next to godliness? Yeah, my mother told me that. And, and the way she told it to me, I assumed it was in the Bible. Right? I've been reading this glorious book for more than 55 years. It ain't there. Now I love to be clean. I really do. I don't like to be dirty. I go for a walk and I come back and phew, I don't want to be near me. I love being clean. I love cleanliness. I thought I loved cleanliness until I saw my son when he was visiting here. That guy was vacuuming in our house three times a week. Wow. But I was told it was the truth, and it's not the truth. It's a, it's a nice idea, it's a good thing to be clean, but it's not what the Bible says, right? Isn't there a lot of things that we've learned over the years, that we've been told, and then we find out, mm, that's not the truth. There's things that we believe ourselves that are not the truth. But we believe them as if they were the truth. But I know without a shadow of a doubt that this is God's truth. And I know that when I read it and I study it, that I'm reading God's truth to us. And I know that Jesus Christ is the truth. He's the truth. Now I'll make mistakes. I hope if I make them and I hear about it, I'll correct it and tell you. But Jesus Christ always spoke in complete harmony with the Father. Have you ever thought about this? Now, we read the Word. We read all the things that they record that Jesus said, right? Have you ever thought about this? Every word that Jesus ever spoke, ever spoke, not just what's recorded in the scripture, but every word he ever spoke was the truth. 
Everything he ever said was directly from the Father. Everything. We never do that, do we? We make errors, we make mistakes. But not just what is recorded in Scripture, but everything that Jesus said was the truth. This is incredible. Must have been a little interesting to be Mary and Joseph. Now, I don't know how Jesus handled all of that. But you can almost sanctify an imagination. <clears throat> Mary's mother, raised in a good Jewish family, and she learned some, something. I already used the godliness, cleanliness is next to godliness, so I can't use that again. <clears throat> and she says it, and Jesus is going like, that's not true. Well, he loved his mother, but it wasn't true. I'm sure that if he corrected her, he did it in such a loving, gracious, beautiful way that she was just filled with joy. Wow, I just learned the truth. Those who profess to believe in God, yet reject Christ, are deceived. You see, because Jesus and the Father are one. In chapter 10 and verse 30, <coughs> Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. Now, let me just say very quickly. If you'd say, well, well, that's him speaking and, you know, maybe he wasn't right. If he was wrong, then don't listen to anything he said. Because you don't know what he believed. You don't know what was right, what was wrong, right? That's why... You're called upon to do what when you hear a message? Search the scriptures daily to see if those things are so, right? You're not just, with, oh, well, pastor said it must be right. Why do I give you verses? So you can look them up. Why do we make the bulletin so you can make notes? So you can do what? Make notes, <laughs> and then look it up. And what a blessing it is to go back and look at the truth in God's Word. If we do not honor the Son, we don't honor God the Father. Uh, in chapter 5, and verse 23, I, I think I may have read this before, but... <clears throat> Jesus said that they should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You will meet people say, I believe in God. And they say, that, and that, they believe that's enough. That's sufficient. I believe in God. But if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, the truth is they don't. They just believe in an idea that there's a God. But they don't really believe in God. God himself said in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. God said to the disciples who were on the mountain, Hear him. God says to you and I, Hear him. Who? Jesus Christ. And as I said, Jesus testified, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. To reject Jesus is to actually call God a liar. John wrote in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. 
But he who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given his son. Now I said there were five. We've had three. So I'm going to save the other two, Lord willing, for next Sunday. Do we truly believe Jesus and who he is? Do we truly have our faith and trust in him and his word? Have we truly put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and we're resting our total faith for eternity, for the salvation, for the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. If we have doubts, if we're not sure, then we need to make sure. And I say to you, if that is your case, don't be embarrassed. Come to us. Let us sit down and talk with you, take you to God's precious word, and show you how you can know for sure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for sending him, taking on human flesh and become man, sending him from heaven. We see his superiority over all. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that Jesus Christ came from heaven and he has first-hand knowledge, first-hand knowledge of everything. He is the truth. He is the Word. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that even though the world and the majority do not believe, that when thy Spirit speaks to our hearts, even in our dreadful sinful condition, you draw us to thy truth, you draw us to thy Son, you turn the light, the spiritual light on, and you bring us out of darkness into the marvelous light of God, and you show us that salvation is Christ and Christ alone. O oh Lord, we praise you and thank you that you have shown the light to us. And we ask thee, Lord, to shine the light of thy truth on anyone who is hearing this message, that they too might come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is in his wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen.